Hi there. We're going to start the uh, presentation now. Um, I'd like to first off uh, introduce myself uh, to the group. Uh, my name is Adam Zimmerman. I'm the critical air specialist uh, for a company called Metropolitan Air Compressor Company. Uh, the topic today, we're going to be chatting about uh, compressed air treatment uh, for food contact, uh, more kind of involved with uh, food and beverage and packaging companies. Uh, before we get the presentation started, uh, a couple items uh, to share. Um, there is a questions box that's located on the, uh, the control panel there. Uh, we'll be answering questions uh, towards the end of the webinar, but if you want to type them in as they come to mind, uh, feel free to type them in, and then we'll we'll bounce back to them at the end of the uh, at the end of the webinar. Also, uh, the recordings and the presentation will be available uh, to everybody in about uh, 24 hours from the time of the presentation. So, as we uh, continue here. Um, I'd like to first stop and uh, thank Perry Johnson for the opportunity to uh, present to this group. Uh, the uh, summary of the presentation, we're basically going to talk just briefly about who Metro Air is. Uh, we'll also chat a little bit about the treatment of compressed air, types of compressors and how to select them, the measurement abilities that are out there, and that towards the end of the presentation here, we're going to talk about uh, questions. So. Metroware, we are a air compressor company. We've been in business since 1975. Uh, we like to boast that we are the largest service department in the area. We do have a certified, certified auditor on staff that does compressed air audits, also does uh, compressed air testing of the quality of air. Uh, everybody within the staff is KGI trained, which is the Compressed Air and Gas Institute. So, uh, we do offer turnkey systems, everything from placing the equipment to installing it, to the piping, to the ductwork, and uh, we solely focus only on the compressed air and the vacuum industry. We don't really dabble in anything else. So this is really our specialty. Um, so why is it important to keep the compressed air cleaned? Um, well, basically, from production to process, handling, packaging, transportation, food and beverage, uh, compressed air can really compromise uh, the quality of the product. Um, as you look at ambient air, it might seem clean, uh, but everything within that is obviously pulled in by the compressor. Uh, and some compressor technologies can also contaminate the air itself. So, obviously, if it looks clean, once you pressurize it and, and concentrate it, it's not always the same. So the struggle a lot of times with compressed air is there's a lot of opinions, um, but uh, not all of them are as defined and not of them as strict as we'd like to see. Uh, if you're looking at, for example, the uh, FDA and the FSMA, uh, they don't really have regulations there, but they, they kind of want you to base it on a, a risk-based. Um, what some people might feel is clean or free of contaminants might be their uh, a different opinion from other people. So what we really do is we try to compile everybody's opinion and then take the most demanding of those purification levels. So uh, at the bottom of this slide, you'll see negative 40 for a dew point, 0.01 milligrams per meters cubed for oil, uh, particulates is 0.01 micron, and then really getting into the efficiencies of those filters too. Uh, we'd like to see 99.999% filtration retention, specifically at the point of use. So all this data compiled up seems confusing, but if you really take it and fine tune it to what the most demanding purification levels are, that's usually what the folks in my industry will recommend. But we always have this chart that we lean back on. So this is ISO 8573-1. This chart's nice because it breaks down three of the contaminants that we're looking for, particulates, moisture, and oil and really classifies them into a, a, a number we can shoot for. So we take these numbers and we apply the technology to it to reach these numbers. So I'm going to reference back to this chart uh, quite a few times throughout the presentation. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we need to define the difference between contact and indirect contact because not every application of compressed air in your facility comes in direct contact with the food. So contact is a process whereby the compressed air actually is either part of the process or comes in contact with the process. Uh, where indirect, it, it's, it's maybe exhausted into the ambient conditions or it might be on the surface of something, it might be used for cleaning, might not actually be injected into the product, but it's going to be in the area. So 
obviously not as stringent, but still something to keep in mind and pay attention to. So when we look at those two, we really want to identify the classifications we're shooting for. So for product contacts, uh, for particles, we're looking at class two. For dew point, class two as well, which is a negative 40 degree dew point, pressure dew point, uh, negative 40 C, negative 40 F are exactly the same right there. It's where that, 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 uh, those two points cross. And then the concentration of total oil is class one. Um, you might also hear the, the definition of class zero. Class zero is essentially uh, anything better than class one. Uh, on the indirect side, however, we're not as stringent. Uh, the particulate, sure, but the moisture contact in the air, we're looking at a class four, uh, concentration of oil class two. So we still want that air to be clean, but we're not going to be as strict since it doesn't come in contact with the actual product. So these two charts were provided by uh, Bridge Compressed Air Society. They do a really good job of, of identifying really the difference between them and what we should be shooting for. So back to our ISO chart here, we're going to start off with moisture, and I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time on this topic because uh, it's, it's usually the main battle, oil too, but usually moisture is a big battle for a lot of, uh, of people and their facilities. So uh, as we get into it, very basic, why is it important to remove the moisture from the compressed air? And simply put, uh, obviously it can damage your equipment, it can damage the end product, but it also can contaminate the end product. Uh, if, if you're making something that somebody's going to consume, we obviously don't want to dump liquid water into it, which can cause other issues, not just the quality of your product, but actually how safe it is to consume. Um, also, looking at the picture there, uh, it could cause rust and scale uh, in the pipes as well. So not something you want in your, uh, in your product. Also, it could breed microorganisms. Uh, compressed air, is, it's, a, it's a dark, warm, wet pipe constantly being fed with oxygen obviously breeds microorganisms as well if we don't do a good job of taking care of the moisture. Uh, and lastly, uh, and freezing of the air lines. Uh, as you're dumping water into the, into the system, uh, if you're not removing it and you have a facility that uh, has a, an ambient condition that's uh, a little cooler, uh, under the freezing point, you can actually freeze up uh, your actuators or actually have uh, freezing in the air lines themselves. So before we go further, really the definition of dryness is the question here. How do you actually define dry? Uh, looking at those two pictures, both of them very warm climates, uh, the one on the left in the desert, the one on the right uh, could be uh, in the rainforest. Uh, both of them are hot, but what's the real difference there? And the definition of dryness really comes down to the relative humidity, 10% uh, or 90%, obviously arid or humid, is really how you define dry. So what really is relative humidity? And essentially, it's a percentage of saturation of the air. But what is it relative to? And that picture there gives you an indication is relative to temperature. At different temperatures, air can hold water in a form of a vapor at a different level. And as you increase temperature, the air can hold more water. And the rule of thumb that we throw out there is every 20 degrees, that temperature rises, that air can hold twice as much water. And that's really kind of in the, in the range of temperatures that we're, we're working with here. So the difference between a 40 degree day and a 60 degree is a big deal. This between a 60 degree day and an 80 degree is a big deal, big deal, and then upward to 100. So that blue line represents basically 100% saturation of, of air, 100% relative humidity. You can never be on the upper left side of that line. As you move, if you started at 80 degrees and you moved less, the water would start to condense and drop out because you can never be above that line. It also represents the dew point of the air. So examples of dew point in real life is obviously dew on the grass in the morning, uh, or on, a, on glass, or on steam from a hot shower, or a Coke can or, or a, a pop can is a great example. The temperature of the can is colder, and that temperature is lower than the dew point in the room. So any water molecules that come in contact and touch that can are going to condense against it. So you'll see uh, you'll see those examples in uh, in real life. So why do we use dew point instead of relative humidity as a measurement of moisture in the compressed air world? And, it, and the simple answer is essentially it's an exact number. If I said 
I wanted a, a moisture content of uh, 80 degrees and 50% relative humidity. That's great, but as soon as the temperature changes, it's really hard to really know what that means. So a dew point is a pretty specific number. I want a 30 degree dew point in my compressed air system, meaning that as long as the temperature stays above 38 degrees of that air, I'll never or I shouldn't see any moisture condense in the form of a liquid. So really how big of a problem is this? So when you have this chart uh, is a good example of how many gallons of water are entering your system per day and per 100 CFM. So uh, really to give you an idea, every one horsepower of compressed air will produce four CFM. So 100 CFM is merely just a 25 horsepower compressor. So you can imagine if you start getting to 100 or 200 or 300 horsepower compressors, these numbers climb quite a bit. So uh, a pretty normal summer day of 80 degrees and 70% relative humidity will put out almost 20 gallons of water into your system per 100 CFM. So it's obviously something we have to have to handle. And also pressure plays a big part of dew point as well. As I raise the pressure, the dew point also goes up. So looking at this chart in the bottom, if you were to look at a 7 degree, 70 degree ambient day at 100 pounds, water starts to condense at 140 degrees. So your typical compressor's discharge temperature is going to be about 15 to 20 degrees above ambient. So on a 70 degree day, the discharge temperature is 90. Well, you already have your dew point at 140, so you're well below that. So you already have a ton of water dropping out in a liquid form on the discharge of your compressor. So we actually remove with the afterglow in the compressor probably about 50%, 60% of the water right there, but it's coming out liquid. So we have to capture that water out before it dumps down into your system. So it's always imperative to know that. So where is that water dropping out at? So as just mentioned, we're dropping out off the aftercooler, off the compressor. Uh, typically there's a, a water separator right there, so we collect it there. If you have a tank that's in front of your dryer, we've referred to that as a wet tank. Uh, you'll have the moisture dropping out there. You'll have a pre-filter, or you'll have the moisture dropping out there as well. And then obviously your dryer, whether it be refrigerated dryer or desk and dryer, the whole purpose obviously is to remove the moisture there. So You actually have typically two types of dryers uh, that are available in your in your common system, a refrigerated dryer and a desk and dryer. Now there's other technologies out there. You have deliquescence, you have membranes, but for the most part, you're typically gonna see just refrigerated dryers and desk and dryers. So the refrigerated dryers are gonna operate in dew points of relatively 35, maybe up to 55 degrees, where your desk and dryer is gonna bring you from negative 40 down to negative 100. So for food contact applications, we want that dew point at negative 15 degrees F or lower. Uh, at negative 15 and better, we find that the breathing of microorganisms is less likely at that lower dew point. Obviously, you're not feeding those uh, microorganisms with, with moisture to breathe. So a desk and dryer is highly recommended for food contact applications. So Understanding these different technologies, a refrigerated dryer is just like it sounds. It uses a refrigerant to cool the air. As the air comes in to the dryer, it's pre-cooled by the air leaving the dryer, and then it hits the refrigerant to air exchanger where the temperatures drop down. Now, the temperatures drop down roughly, roughly to 38 degrees, so all the moisture starts to fall out. But I can't just send 38 degree air back into your plant. It's, it's kind of cold. It would cause sweating of the pipes. But also, if you remember the definition of dryness, is based on relative humidity. So even though I removed moisture, at this point, I would be 38 degrees, but it would also be 100% relative humidity. So what we do is we send the air back through and we pass it by the air coming in. So the air coming into the dryer is pre-cooled by the air leaving out, or vice versa, the air leaving is reheated by the air coming in, which then drops our RH, or relative humidity, back down to an acceptable level, so we're technically now drier than when we, were, when we came in. So since that uses refrigerant, 
and it uses temperature to drop the dew point, if you needed a dew point less than 32, obviously you can't do that refrigerated dryer. Your refrigerated dryer starts going under 32, no longer just removing moisture, you're, you're basically creating ice cubes, which not good, you don't want anything freezing inside your equipment, uh, that's obviously gonna cause other issues. So when we need to go under 32, we go desk and dryers. And desk and dryers are essentially just these two towers that rotate back and forth, and they're filled with, with desk in. So we can get you down to dew points of negative 40 or even all the way down to uh, negative 100. So uh, obviously extremely dry. So how does a desk and bead work? So those towers that you saw were all both filled with uh, desk and beads. Now, desk and beads are extremely porous, hydroscopic, uh, 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 little beads that they, they attract moisture to them naturally. So we fill these towers with these beads, and they could be activated aluminum, they could be a silica gel, they could be a molecular sieve, really depending on how deep of a dew point you go, the manufacturer, the dryer, will custom fill or custom design that, that, that tower to fill with these beads uh, based on what you need. So the difference between absorption and adsorption, absorption or adsorption, is really key here. Uh, I love this picture because it looks like these two could be related. Absorption is when you take something in internally. Adsorption, AD, is when it sticks to your surface. And that's essentially what a desk and bead does, which is good because if it's just sticking to the surface, then it's also easy to remove. If it went internal to the bead, it would be a lot more difficult to take off. So when we're looking at a desk and dryer operation, I spent a little time on this because this is really what the recommendation is for food contact is this technology. So we have a few different types of desk and dryers. The simplest one and the more common one for smaller systems is heatless. So you have compressed air that comes in through a pre-filter and then it enters into the bottom of a drying tower. Uh, this tower then adsorbs the moisture from the compressed air and as it exits the top of the tower, it goes out into your system and hopefully, if the system was de designed correctly, we'd be leaving at a negative 40 or better uh, dew point. Uh, however, once I saturate that tower with water, I have to switch to the other one. And when I switch to the other tower, I'm gonna start filling that one with moisture. But before I switch back to the first tower, I gotta get the water back out. So we take a, a slight bypass of the air that's exiting the dryer, and in a heatless dryer, we take about 15% of that air, which we refer to as purge, and we run it through the top and push the moisture back out the bottom of the desk and tower that we're now regenerating. So that air that we're using is at negative 40. It's extremely dry, extremely thirsty, and we're also allowing it to span, expand the ambient. So the concentration of that moisture inside that really, really dry air goes down even more. So that allows us to pull the moisture back off the desk skin. So when we look at that the, a good analogy there is a hair dryer. Uh, the dry hair, your hair, we're essentially blowing air over the surface of the hair and then it just pulls the moisture right off the hair. So we could take it one step further though. So we can add heat to this dryer. So the process for the drying side is essentially the same. We come in the bottom, we move our way through the towers, the desk and adsorbs the moisture, we send out dry air to your plant we also take some of that air and we have to regenerate that offline tower. But with a heated purge dryer, instead of taking 15% of your air, we drop it down to seven. And then we add this little heater in the middle. So by adding the heat, I'm also increasing the temperature of air, which now that air can hold more moisture. So not only is it extremely dry, it's extremely hot now. And as I increase the temperature of air, it can hold more moisture. So I'm making it even more thirsty, so to speak. Uh, this technology will save you energy. Uh, it's, it's a good alternative to the heat list when you get into bigger systems because 15% of compressed air is a lot of money. Since you spend a lot of money making that air, we don't want to use 15% of it for no reason. So we drop it down to 7%. So that's a nice alternative to just going heatless. And then taking it one step further, we can use what's called a heated blower purge dryer. So on this dryer, again, the same way, air comes in the bottom of the drying tower, goes through, gets absorbed, all the moisture, sends it downstream, 
And then to regenerate, instead of running purge air to regenerate, we take a blower that pulls air from ambient. We run that blower through a heater, and then we run that air from the blower and the heater top down through the regenerating tower to dry it back out. Uh, you still do use purge air because anytime you run a heated dryer, once you're done regenerating that tower, you do have to cool it off. I can't send 300 degree air downstream. Obviously, you would understand the risk in doing that. So before I switch back to that tower I just regenerated, I have to cool it. So we're going to run either purge air through that to cool it, or we could run a blower to cool it. If you use the blower, though, you are pulling air from ambient. So you're going to reload that bed with a little bit of moisture. So that's not a great option if you're in the south in a humid area with lots of moisture. Uh, if you're in the north and it's the winter and the air is already kind of dry, you might be able to use that during those winter months to do that. But you will have a dew point spike. So as soon as that tower jump switches to the other tower, uh, it will jump the dew point up a little bit. It will come back down to negative 40. But if negative 40 or negative 15 or better, in this case for food contact, is an absolute must, then that's not a great option for you. However, the heated blower purge is still more efficient than a heated purge and obviously much, much more efficient than a heat list dryer. However, all three dryer technologies will accomplish the job needed. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, of investment and a matter of energy savings. So obviously, no matter what, it's critical to get that dew point down. Now, no matter how good your dryer is, whether it be refrigerated, or, or duskin or membrane or anything, as you're removing moisture, it does you no good unless you can actually remove it with a drain. So there are obviously uh, a few different technologies of drains out there. Uh, I joke that drains are probably the cheapest thing in the whole system, but can probably cause the most headaches in your system as well. Uh, drains can be as simple as a ball valve, obviously very reliable, but not a great uh, use because it's a huge waste of energy. Uh, the top middle drain there uh, is a timer drain. Timer drains are somewhat reliable. However, they're not exactly smart. You set them to fire for so many seconds every so often. Now, as temperatures change throughout the day or through the seasons, the amount of moisture in the air changes. So unless you're back there changing those dials constantly, you'll be wasting a lot of compressed air by blowing it out for no reason. Uh, so it works, but it's not exactly efficient. Uh, the top right and the bottom left are both floats. Uh, those are zero loss. You won't lose any compressed air, but the, the problem with floats is they have a tendency to hang up as the particulates and the oil and all the other stuff being sucked in by the compressor kind of condenses in the filters. Uh, you can see how a float that's trying to operate up and down can hang up. So we usually recommend the, either the bottom middle one or the bottom right one, which are both zero loss. Uh, but they're both extremely reliable drains. Um, so that technology is typically recommended. So again, it's, it's not the biggest investment in your system. So you can, you can put a little more effort into making sure that your dryers are great, but you, you got to make sure that we're getting good drainage out of the system. Uh, I will tell you, on most of the service calls that we have for moisture problems, a lot of them lead back to a drain failure. The dryer is working fine. The system's operating fine, but the drains are plugged. Moving on, oil. So back to our ISO 8573-1 chart, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about oil. So probably one of the other big nemesis in a compressed air system, probably the one that scares the people the most, uh, hydrocarbons obviously not good to consume. So when we're looking at oil, the simplest way to uh, to remove oil is to not put it into a system. So you have really two technologies out there to choose from when we're looking at compressors. You have an oil-free air compressor and you have an oil flooded. So starting with oil flooded, this cutaway is the cutaway of, of a rotary screw air compressor. Uh, this is the, the pump or the part where we're using to compress the air. Uh, those screws spin against each other. You have a female and you have a male rotor that is spinning. They pull in air, and as the air moves down the length of them, it compresses. And an oil-flooded air compressor, we will take oil, we will inject it into those screws to help with cooling, to help with lubrication, um, help with sealing, so we get good compression. 
great for the machine, bad for the process. Uh, so oil-free air compressors are available. Oil-free air compressors have no injection. There is no oil that comes in contact from the compressor. Uh, we don't mix oil in the air like we do with an oil flooded. Oil-free compressors uh, compress the air in a couple of stages. Uh, they are a little bit more of an investment, but when you look at the alternative of what could happen if oil got into your product, uh, some might consider cheap insurance. So a lot of times we're looking at oil flooded compressors and the conversation is really how bad is it? How much oil are we really talking about that's coming out of these air compressors? Regardless of whose brand it is, doesn't matter who's manufacturing that air compressor, if it's an oil flooded air compressor, all of them will pass oil. And a good conservative number to reference is, is four parts per million is the norm. So if you're a, a facility that runs around the clock, 24 seven, 8,000 hours a year, looking at just a hundred horsepower compressor at four parts per million, you're talking about 10 gallons of oil that is going downstream. 200 horsepower is almost 20 and you start to grow, that's a lot of oil. So we really have to make a, a good effort of taking that out if that's the type of compressor technology you opt to choose for your facility. So obviously we can start with the simplest way to move oil and, and that's with a filter. Uh, you can get a coalescing filter and you also have particulate filters. Um, a lot of times they're, they're very similar filters. Uh, the difference is with a coalescing filter, it's an inside out filtration. We bring the air in to the middle of the actual filter element and it moves its way out. With a particulate filter, we actually sometimes refer to them as reverse flow. They come from the outside of the element in. The reason why I bring this up is you don't want to mix, mix these up. If you're trying to actually get oil out of the system, you actually need a coalescing filter and it has to be particularly bought for that application. So coalescing filters, uh, there's, there's a three-step process there. Obviously, you're trying to get the big stuff on the outside. You get a little impingement and separation by trapping molecules, but you also get what's called the Bronian effect where the molecules are bouncing off and the fibers eventually they will stop. So the importance of this is you need a really good depth filter if you're really trying to capture the oil coming out of the system. And I'm really referring to this type of filter at, at, at the compressor room, after the compressor, close to where we're supplying the air. Towards the point of use is a different, different type of filter we would really typically recommend. Um, but we really want to have a nice depth filter in this area. And you have multiple ratings of these filters from 25 micron all the way down to 0.01 micron. But keep in mind, the tighter that filter, the higher the pressure drop over it. And uh, another good rule of thumb to keep in mind is every two pounds in pressure is 1% in your energy. And if anybody's ever done an air audit or an energy analysis of a compressed air system, they'll know a compressed air is extremely expensive. So even a couple points and percentages of energy really adds up to a lot of money. So if you're really trying to remove oil, you can't just go in and drop in a 0.01 filter because it's, it's, it's too tight of an element. It's going to be clogged extremely quick. So you're typically staging these filters. Uh, maybe you start with a 5 micron, then a 1, and then a 0.01. Um, but the point being is, is multiple filters will cause a high pressure drop. So understand the, the, the risk that you pose there with energy uh, also as well. Uh, you could take it one step further with filtration. You can use what's called activated carbon. Activated carbon is only intended to remove oil vapor, uh, not liquid oil, not aerosols, uh, just your vapors. Uh, you have a couple different options for activated carbon. You can get it in a cartridge form where it has a lot more contact or you can get it in a filter element form where activated carbon is kind of inside the, the folds or inside the uh, inside the elements fibers itself. Um, again, it's just for oil vapor and a lot of times uh, people get this mixed up and think that it's actually removing a lot of oil. The intent of an activated carbon filter was really to remove oil, uh, oil vapor odors. Uh, we use it a lot with breathing air systems to, to take out any odors in the air. Um, it will show a really nice retention of 0 0.003 milligrams of meters cubed, but again, uh, it, it's, it's a very short-lived element. You're going to be changing it very quickly. And also keep in mind, activated carbon is essentially a desiccant. 
So it's got to be installed downstream of any dryers in your system. You cannot put it upstream of a dryer. The water will completely saturate that element. And in doing so, if it's covered in water, it does a really, really bad job of picking up any oil in the system. Uh, also, a big no-no, uh, never install an activated carbon filter downstream of a heated desk and dryer. As we just talked about with those heated desk and dryers, they do get hot. And if for some reason it should fail and not cool properly and start dumping heat downstream, obviously you can picture what would happen if you have a vessel filled with oil and you dump hot air into it, it becomes uh, obviously extremely dangerous. Uh, so we don't ever want to put those downstream. So those filters I was referring to before in the previous slides really kind of intended for general purpose for, for compressed air rooms where you're trying to capture the bulk of anything coming out of the compressor. If we're talking a critical application where the compressed air is coming in contact with the product at the point of use and there is an oil flooded system and there are contaminants in that air, um, even including particulates, we're always going to recommend really, really strong tight point of use filtration. It's going to be uh, a low micron filter and it's also going to be recommended that it's 99.999% uh, efficient. Uh, we want really high retention there. Um, there are a number of uh, manufacturers out there that do it. They'll make them in stainless steel for you as well. Um, but the point being is anytime you have a critical application that compressed air really needs to be treated at the point of use. So another really good technology, probably one that's uh, not well known, but fantastic technology is, is a, a catalytic converter. Um, this technology is not a new technology. Catalytic converter has been around on cars for a long time. Uh, but how this works is the hydrocarbons in the compressed air will enter this device. And this device uses heat to activate a catalyst. And once the catalyst is activated, it will actually use a process of molecular cracking and break apart all the hydrocarbons in the air. And it separates them into individual carbons and individual hydrogens. And then it oxidates those two molecules. So our byproducts are CO2, harmless gas, and H2O. Well, water, not exactly harmless, but if you install this upstream of your dryer, we obviously know how to get rid of it at that point. The other very cool thing about this product is Hydrocarbons are the building blocks of life. So microorganisms are also removed. So this type of technology will remove oil, will also remove microorganisms. And you can use this technology either in a, in a centralized system right off of your compressor, typically stop about 700 CFM is the largest you can get at this time. But you can also go down to 35. So it makes a really good point of use application. These devices don't make any noise, don't radiate any heat. Um, they don't are not affected by ambient conditions. So they're very non-nuisance uh, pieces of equipment. Um, great technology. Uh, something definitely recommended for the person that has an oil flooded system that maybe is not willing to make that big investment to go to an oil-free system, oil-free compressors, and have a huge capital cost, but knows he needs to be oil-free. So we offer, often recommend a, a catalytic converter to, to get him to that point. So anything coming out of this device is oil-free and microorganisms are free. So a lot of people ask for food-grade oil. Um, food-grade oil can be used instead of a synthetic oil in an oil-flooded air compressor. Uh, food grade oil will work. Uh, it has a shorter lifetime. Uh, there are blends of food grade oil where the manufacturers of the oil are claiming that it will last you 8,000 hours. Uh, still kind of jury still kind of out on that. That's still relatively new. Uh, food grade oil lacks the additives that make a synthetic oil a really good lubricant. Those additives were in there for a reason. Uh, so in the food grade oil, they're removed. So it doesn't make for a great lubricant. And you'll find uh, a lot of times with food grades that uh, you're putting the life of your compressor more at risk. It's, it's safer for your products, not so much for your compressor. You'll find that you'll varnish up your air ends a lot faster and you'll have issues with your compressors. So we usually recommend, uh, I, I usually always recommend H1 lubricants. Um, these are intended for compressed air. But the most important thing to remember with a food grade lubricant, if you go down this road, it's only for incidental contact. 
it's not for something constantly dumping oil into your product and, and not worrying about it. You really still do need to filter. You really do still need to take care of all the point of use filtration. This just protects you should you have the compressor dump more oil than normal or should you have a compressor where it fails and it blows what we call the separator, which is the filter that holds the oil in this machine, if it gets downstream, it's less likely to cause major, major issues. But again, incidental is a key word there. So really, if I look at this with oil, I look at it as you really have three options. You have oil flooded air compressor where you can add filtration. And I'm going to throw the catalyst technology into that as a filtration, not technically a filter, but we're accomplishing the same thing. We're removing oil. So you do have that option. The downside with this option is filters are sized for flow. They're sized for pressure. Uh, you got to change the, the elements quite regularly. Um, and what I mean is size for flow, if I put a filter in there that's size for 500 CFM and you have a varying demand that goes 500 CFM max, but sometimes it's 250, sometimes 100 CFM, sometimes it's 300 CFM, the retention rate of that filter goes down. Um, so it's very difficult to have really good retention, which is filtration, when you're talking about a system that varies a lot. Um, you also got to keep in mind, if you do have a failure and that separator does fail inside an air compressor, you do dump the bulk of the oil out of the compressor into the system. These little tiny filters aren't going to save you. They're going to get saturated really quick, they're going to get filled with oil real quick, and they're going to dump, dump, dump downstream. So this might be your least expensive option, but highly, it's not really your most reliable. Now, you can make it a little bit safer by adding food-grade lubricant to this as another option. So same thing, you still need the filters, still have an oil flooded machine. Uh, the food grade will make it safer, but again, incidental contact being the statement, and you're also gonna find that you probably have to change that lubricant in the machine twice as often as the synthetic was in there um, just to maintain the life of that uh, machine. Of course, oil sampling uh, periodically will help you kind of determine when that's need to be done. So your third option uh, is an oil-free air compressor. Probably your uh, least, least likely to have an issue with oil contamination, um, mm -hmm. but obviously the most expensive out of all the options there. But again, that, that comes down to uh, what you consider is cheap insurance. Uh, if oil got into your products, what would that do, not only to your product, but everything else involved with reputations and recalls and things of that nature and the safety of the people consuming that product? So highly considered looking at those three options, determining what is the most appropriate for your facility. But you do have options. Uh, so back to our ISO chart, we're gonna talk about particulates. Now, out of all the topics, uh, particulates are probably the least complicated, uh, but it, it does merit some conversation. Uh, so we're looking at this red section here, and the ISO chart here breaks it up based on the actual size of the particles and then the count of how many of those particles are in the air is how we rate it. Um, so kind of going back and following the theme, how bad is this problem? In a typical industrial air application, you're finding about 4 million particles, solid particles, in a cubic foot. Once we pressurize that air just to 100 pounds, we're taking 8 cubic feet of air and we're making one cubic foot of air. So we're really concentrating that air. So now we have 32 million particles per cubic foot. Now you do have uh, different sizes obviously in the air. So 80% of the particles are below 10 microns. Obviously we don't have huge chunks in most situations of particles in the air. And you also do have an inlet filter on your compressor and it's roughly five microns. So we capture about 90% of that of the particles there. But that still does leave about two and a half million particles in the air per cubic foot at 100 pounds. So it can't be ignored. So you have a ton of different options for filtration, kind of going back to our previous statement. And I will, I will loop in microorganisms into that too, because a lot of times we're pulling these from ambient. Um, and if we're trying to eliminate microorganisms, uh, appropriate filtration by far is required uh, at the compressor room, but also at the point of use. Uh, microorganisms um, can be handled with dry air. Keeping that dew point under negative 15, using a desk and dryer of some technology 
if the air is going to come in contact with the product is absolutely critical. And then don't forget about your catalyst technology there too. It can also remove the microorganisms from the air. So whether it be particulates or be microorganisms, good filtration is obviously key there. So this is kind of a, a conversation I'd like to have. If, if money and space was never an issue, which it always is, but it wasn't an issue, how would you design this compressed air system? So if you were starting with a compressor, what would you put next? Uh, we talked about the amount of water dropping out of that air compressor at any given time is a lot. So we always want to recommend having some sort of water separator after that compressor. That water separator is basically an empty filter housing, but it has these fins that route the air and spin it, and it forces the air to the outside of the filter housing and forces the water against the housing, and it drops out. Uh, after that, uh, we would recommend a wet tank. Uh, wet tank versus dry tank, the difference is the placement of that tank in relation to your dryer. Uh, if the tank is before your dryer, obviously the air is wet. If it's after, then it's dry. So it's always nice to have a wet tank in the system. It allows moisture to drop out. It allows the, uh, the air to expand and cool a little bit in that tank too, which will help downstream processes with the dryer. Um, if it is an oil flooded system, you are using uh, oil lubricants in your compressor, a mist eliminator is highly recommended. A mist eliminator is basically a huge filter. Uh, picture a, a receiver tank with an element inside. Uh, this allows a big reservoir for oil to settle in. If, if you ever have that separator fail in your compressor, you need something to catch it. And this is what that will do for you. The nice thing about these is the elements typically last 8 to 10 years, so it's not a constantly changing filter. They're really big, so it's actually kind of nice because it takes a lot of work to change that filter. We're really only going to worry about it once a decade. Uh, obviously, we're going to uh, recommend a pre-filter. That's pre because it's going to go before your dryer. Then we recommend the dryer. A uh, dryer could be uh, refrigerated or desiccant. Again, depending on if it's contact or non-contact, will depend on which one we would recommend. And after that dryer, we'll recommend a post-filter. Um, typically, those post-filters are particulate filters um, or reverse flow filters, uh, or they could be tighter filters as well beyond what you had in your pre-filter. It might be a 0.01 micron, or it might be an activated carbon filter. But leaving that, then you go to a dry tank. Um, the reason for a recommendation, recommendation of another tank is simply you pull your air from your storage. Um, if you have a really nice dry tank, nice sized dry tank, you're now pulling air from treated compressed air that's been filtered and been dried. Instead of relying on if your plant takes a big gulp of air, instead of relying on your treatment to be able to hurry up and clean up that air, if you have a really good dry tank, then you can pull from that tank knowing that you have clean air. And, and then if you do have a new size tank, you can also put a flow controller in there. Now, a flow controller is not going to do anything for your quality of air, but it's going to make a big difference in the quality of your processing uh, using compressed air. A flow controller, essentially, it's, it's a big uh, air regulator. So it'll, it'll maintain a nice, stable pressure coming out of those tanks so that the pressure doesn't fluctuate inside your plant. Um, it will save energy for you as well. So how do you choose? How do you select what compressor to go with? And there are a lot of variables that come into it. So pressure is obviously a big, uh, a big part of it. Do you need 150 pounds? Do you need 90 pounds? Do you need 100 pounds? So compressors are typically rated at 100 pounds or 125 pounds or 150 pounds or 175 pounds or even up to the thousands of PSI. So depending on what you need will determine which way we go. Do you need oil free or do you need oil flooded? Uh, what CFM do you require? They make compressors that are called uh, oil free scrolls. Oil free scrolls are good options for low flow oil free needs. Uh, but if you start to get too big, that, that's unlimited off the top table. Uh, noise level sometimes is an issue. If you're putting the compressor around where people are working, obviously you don't want to put something in there that exceeds 85 decibels. Uh, it could be uh, uh, pretty uh, annoying to the people working around it. Uh, footprint is sometimes an issue. Uh, the voltage that you have in your facility determines what we can do. Uh, unfortunately, cost comes into play sometimes. Uh, the ambient conditions, if the ambient conditions are really hot or really dirty, uh, that will determine some uh, of our choices. Uh, I cannot put a variable speed drive air compressor in a hot, dirty environment. The, the drive will fail. So knowing that, 
Uh, what kind of drive type are we doing? Are we doing direct drive? Are we use a coupling? Are we use gear driven? Uh, what types of controls are going to be in that compressor? Are we going to be using what's called load no load controls, where the pressure is operating in a band? Are we going to use modulation? Are we going to use variable speed? Uh, and then storage comes into play. If you don't have great storage, that will influence the type of recommendations we can make as far as what type of compressor selection to do. The whole point of this whole slide is really you is work with a professional and trying to design a system. And I, I will challenge this to you. If you were to ask a, a compressor specialist to come into your facility and bid something and you're asking them to compete for it, they're going to try to keep all these things in mind, but that, that upper right corner one is always in play, right? It's always that price. I can't, I can't design something and price myself out of it. But if you were to ask the question, if this was your facility and money wasn't an issue and footprint wasn't an issue, what would you recommend? And it's really a good conversation because you start to see the creativity and you start to see the design and the engineering come into play saying, if you do this, this, and this, this will be your results. Now, if that's not important to you, then we can remove that and we can remove that or something else is important and we can add that. So the challenge is taking all these variables, fitting it into what applies best to the production um, and, and making uh, a system the best it could possibly be. So uh, I'm going to end up on this topic probably here, uh, measurement. Uh, technology throughout the world has changed so much and I'm going to use the analogy of, uh, of cars. Uh, we would never drive a car down the road if it didn't have some type of measurement. We're, we're measuring speed. We're measuring the volume of gas we have in a car. You would never drive, most people would never drive the car without a gas gauge, without a speedometer. Um, so we're looking at those things. It's a constant measurement of, of the performance of a vehicle. And it's even gotten so crazy with uh, sensors measuring when to stop and uh, even sensors to tell you the temperature outside and, 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 and where cars are around you, the measurement in a, in a vehicle has gotten so, uh, so it's really cool technology. Uh, I use this one a lot. My, my seven-year-old boy knows what this symbol means. Uh, anyway, drives a car that has a sensor that measures tire pressure. My question to you is when's the last time you actually walked around your car with that gauge and actually measured the pressure? And probably if in most cases, never or very unlikely. And the reason why is you have the peace of mind knowing that you have a sensor in your car that constantly keeps an eye on the tire pressure. So the question being, an analogy from this, is with compressed air, why would we treat it any differently? There are a ton of sensors out there in the market that measure not only the performance, not only efficiency, but the quality of the compressed air. And the quality being the, obviously the key topic here, if you have a food plant or a beverage plant or a pharmaceutical plant or a packaging plant and you're not measuring the dew point, you're really missing out on a really cool measurement feature here. The second, not the second, within seconds or within minutes of having a dryer failure or a drain failure, you will know there is an issue if you put a dew point sensor in there. If you don't, the first time you find out that you have an issue is when somebody on the floor comes to you and says, there is water in the lines. And if that is the case, it is too late. You already have contamination. Uh, you can also put temperature probes in there. Temperature affects how everything else in the system works. The hotter the temperature of the compressed air, the more difficult it is to dry, the less likelihood that your dryers are going to be forming hitting their dew points. Also can affect how much oil is coming out of the air compressor. Hotter temperatures have a tendency to create more oil vapor coming out of the compressor, which is very difficult to coalesce or impossible. Vapors will pass right through all your filters. So adding sensors to your system is, uh, is like I've mentioned before a couple times, cheap insurance. You also have sensors that actually measure the actual oil in the compressed air in real time. Uh, this sensor is pretty cool. It's an oil carbon vapor sensor. It will not only tell you how many milligrams or meters cubed of oils in your air, but also tells you what ISO class you're falling into. And this can be something you can trend and you can run reports on, uh, a nice sensor to add to the system. Now, when we're talking about those types of sensors, that's constantly checking. That's, that's, that's monitoring your system 24-7. That's, that's the preferred, in our opinion, preferred way you, you measure what is going on with the compressed air. However, SQF does require you to to regularly monitor the quality of your compressed air. So we do air sampling. And when we do air sampling, we check for oil. 
we check for particulates, we check for moisture, and we can check for microorganisms. Uh, we use a lab called Trace Analytics in Texas. They're extremely good. They're really good people. Um, they do a great job with this. So having somebody come in or training someone on your staff to go through and, and check this is, is critical for SQF, but it's also a good way to make sure that everything that you're using compressed air for uh, is an appropriate purity. And I'll end with this. Uh, since we are a service-driven company, um, an unmaintained system will not perform as well. Uh, you'll, you'll pass more oil. You'll have less likely if your dryer is performing well. You'll get more particulates and contaminants downstream. A good maintenance program, a good controls program, a good measurement program are your best defenses. Uh, if you're not maintaining the compressor uh, and the filters and the dryers and the drains and everything in that system, uh, obviously the likelihood of having contaminants, it, it goes up significantly. So from there, I'll leave off uh, with uh, opportunity for you to uh, ask questions. So there is a uh, question box here. And let me see if I can pull up some of these here. I see a question from uh, Amber Jordan. What's the next slide? Please display. I'm sorry, I don't uh, recognize the uh, the question there. I apologize. Please display what's next slides again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I can do that. And again, these, uh, this presentation, uh, the audio and the actual presentation itself uh, will be available uh, within 24 hours uh, for you guys to look at. Uh, but the, uh, the slides should be up in front of you um, right now. So uh, again, going through water separators and uh, filtration and dryers and things like that. Uh, another question, uh, is class one through six all acceptable? Um, class one through six uh, regarding particulates, oil, or dew point um, all depends on if it's a contact or a non-contact application, meaning if the air compressor comes in contact with the product, then no, not one through six is all acceptable. You're going to want to be uh, a two on your particulates, you're going to want to be at class two on your moisture content, and you're going to be at a minimum of class one, uh, and most of us are actually recommending a class zero, which is essentially anything better than one, uh, for contact. Uh, for non-contact, we're a little less strict. We're a two on the particulates, a four on the moisture, and a two on the oil. Hope that answers your question. Can you please tell us the microorganism range in air? Um, that's a good question. Um, so SQF has, has given the recommendation to check for microorganisms, but they haven't made the recommendations to what they should be should you find any. Uh, also the same thing for particulates, moisture, and oil. It's to check for these, but there is no saying if you find them or anything else is outside this range, then it's there. So when we do the microorganism check, we, we essentially run the air over an auger plate. And depending on the customer, they usually kind of make the determination if they have any growth on that plate, what to do with it. And, and, and sometimes it's as simple as they look at it and they see less than four cultures growing. They feel safe. If they see more than that, they make a change. Some people say, if I see anything, it's not good. Um, in my opinion, if you're finding anything in your air, um, it, it's time to really look at why that's coming into your system, and do we have good drying, and do we have good filtration. Um, the easiest thing to do is, if when you're checking that range, is to go and, and, and put uh, the appropriate filtration 
at that point of view is where you're finding anything coming through as a contaminant. Okay, how do you correct a finding which is not 221 for direct contact if you feel we are maintaining all of our filters, et cetera? Um, so if you're not hitting the 221 requirement in direct contact, uh, I think the best thing to do is, is to go back. Obviously, uh, maintaining your filters is, is important, right? You want to be changing those filters. But I would check the uh, retention rate of those filters, and I would check the micron rating of those filters. Um, I would also check the, the dryer itself. If you can get uh, portable dew point monitors that you can pull dew point anytime, any place in your facility, um, you can have an auditor come in and do that for you. Uh, you can check it with uh, air sampling, uh, but I would check the dryer application as well. So the dryer can affect the, the, the quality of the filter too. If you're saturating a filter with water constantly, um, it, it has a less likelihood of doing its, its job correctly. Um, you're, your real, your real struggle there is, is if the filters aren't working, what else is going wrong? And a, a lot of times it, it, it's going to be a performance issue with the compressor. Are my, are my coolers cleaned out? Uh, has my oil been changed uh, correctly? Am I, am I maintaining about 180 degree temperature inside my compressed air, which is the optimum temperature for everything else downstream? Um, so checking the dryer application, checking the compressor application, checking the quality of the filter and how tight that filter is, uh, having a a good maintenance plan is also also key, as your question uh, indicated there. Uh, I have another question. What is the max limit for it in air? Um, not quite sure what the question was asking. I apologize. With that, hopefully I've answered all your questions. Um, if there's any more, we got a few more minutes. Uh, I'll give you about 30 more seconds to throw them out there. Uh, hopefully we're fast typers. But um, again, the presentation will be available, uh, and so will the audio. Uh, I want to thank Perry Johnson again for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, please feel free to uh, reach out uh, to Perry Johnson or to Metro Air Compressor. Uh, we are located in, uh, in Michigan, uh, but uh, we do have... Uh, uh, partners all over the country that can also help and assist and uh, very well trained, well versed in uh, compressed air. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, allow you guys to uh, go about your day. So thank you very much. Uh, any questions, let us know. And uh, I look forward to the next time. Thank you.